to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. Today we are continuing our study of the religion of Islam by looking at the integrity of the Quran. Is the Quran, the Bible of Islam, really trustworthy? Can we look at the evidence and know that it's validated by truth and by the evidence? Or is this a book that has major inconsistencies and contradictions? We hope that you'll think about these things with us today in our study of Islam. And as always, if you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons on Islam, we're willing to send you all four lessons on a DVD or CD free of charge. You can go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, where we have a free media re request form that you can fill out, or you can call us or write to us, and we'll share with you the information we've presented in these lessons about Islam. And as always, if you've got a, a Bible question, something that you're studying or thinking about of a spiritual nature, we'd love to help you with that. Please write to us or call us. We encourage you to visit as well the Church of Christ in your area, and they'd love to sit down and study the Scriptures with you. Let's now direct our attention to the subject at hand, the integrity of the Quran. By, integri by integrity, we mean the, the state of being undiminished, uh, perfect, unimpaired, uh, the state of being right. Is the Quran in that state? Is it right and from God? Is it, is it complete? Is it a perfect book that God gave us? Well, let's look at the evidence. And friend, as we share this information, again, we're citing from the Quran itself. We're citing from Islamic sources to show the evidence which leads to the conclusion the Quran is not from God. And the evidence demands that. All right, let's present that evidence. Here it is. One of the major problems that we have with the Quran in recognizing it as a book from God and a book that is perfect is you've got people in the Quran before those people even existed. Now, let me show you. The Quran says in chapter 20, verses 85 through 88, and in verse 95, these words. He, God said, We have tempted thy people since thou didst leave them. The Samaritan has led them into error. Then Moses returned. And we cast them gold ornaments as the Samaritan also threw them into the fire. Then he brought them out for a calf, a mere body that lowed. And they said, This is your God and the God of Moses, whom you have forgotten. Moses said, And you, Samaritan, what was your business? Now, here we have basically uh, the story that we know of in the Bible as the golden calf where Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to get the two tablets. He's gone a little longer than the people thought he should have been gone. And so they get nervous. They think he's dead. They start taking their gold. Aaron makes a gold calf, and Moses comes back, and they're worshiping it. You remember he breaks the stones and all the things that go along with that. And so that's basically the story that we have. And we're not even really focusing on the story, but a detail in the story that shows us the Quran is not a holy book. Think about this. We have in that mentioning there a Samaritan. How can a Samaritan have led the Israelites astray at the time of the golden calf with Moses in approximately 1400 B.C. when the Samaritans didn't even exist until hundreds of years later? The city of Samaria was founded by King Omri in 870 B.C. The Samaritans didn't even exist until after the exile of the northern kingdom of Israel and their resettlement under King Sargon II in 722 B.C. when non-Israelites adopted a mixture of the religion between the Jews and their polytheistic background. Think about this. The Samaritans did not exist. Listen now, don't miss this. 
The Samaritans did not exist until 530 years after Moses. What? You've got the account in the Quran that at 1400 B.C. there was a Samaritan tempting the Israelites to worship the golden calf and the Samaritans as a people and as a word don't even exist for 530 years later. Uh-oh, that's a big blunder. How'd that happen? My friend, Muhammad wrote the book of the Quran, not God. Muhammad made these things up and this proves that this is not a book from God. By this mistake alone, the Quran can be rendered unreliable and certainly not an inerrant book from God. How could anyone look at that evidence? This is like, this is like the Mormon Bible having the church in existence a hundred years before it did. How can that happen? You've got problems there. Joseph Smith made some things up. Muhammad and Joseph Smith both made things up and purported a, a great hoax on people as it relates to religion. But that's not the only error that you have. In the Quran, we also have the error in Moses' adoption. Here's what the Quran says about Moses' adoption in chapter 28, verse number 9. In this story, we find that it contradicts the biblical Exodus 2.10 version, which states that it was Pharaoh's daughter who adopted Moses. It's important to note here that Pharaoh's wife adopted Moses. He would have consequently been adopted by Pharaoh himself. This, this again alone makes it unbelievable. Here's what it says. And the wife of Pharaoh said, He will be a comfort of the eye for me and for you. Do not kill him. Perhaps me may benefit us or may adopt him as a son. And they perceived not. And so basically it was Pharaoh's wife who found Moses and they were going to adopt Moses as their son. What does the Bible say? Exodus chapter 2 verse 10. And the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, not wife, and he became her son. So he called his name Moses saying, because I drew him out of the water. Now you say, okay, well those two differ. What's the big deal? Well, friend, here's the big deal. The Quran claims the Torah is from God. The Torah includes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Exodus being the second book in the Torah records the story of Moses' adoption by Pharaoh's daughter in the Hebrew, in the, in the, in the, in the Hebrew, in the translations that were made, in every account in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You're going to find every account has the adoption of Moses in the Torah by Pharaoh's daughter, and yet the Quran has Pharaoh's wife. And so if the Quran says the Torah is from God, and the Torah contradicts the Quran, what does that say about the Quran? Friend, we've got big problems again. They both can't be right, and we see inconsistencies and contradictions again in these type of things. And so we have the error not only about the Samaritans, but about the adoption of Moses as well. But we also have problems with certain names in the Quran. For example, according to the Quran, no one ever bore the name of Yahya, that is before John the Baptist. Chapter 19 verse 7 says that. Here's what it says. O Zechariah, indeed we give you good tidings of a boy whose name will be John. We have not assigned to any before this name. And so the Quran says, uh, speaking allegedly on behalf of God, that your son Zechariah's name is going to be John. Nobody else has ever had that name before. Well, there's only one problem. We find that name mentioned in the Old Testament. In 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 23, implying that it was a well-known name hundreds of years before the writing of the Quran. Here's what it says. Now when all the captains of the armies and their men heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah governor, they come to Gedaliah at Mizpah, Ishmael the son of Nathaniah, and here it is, Jehanan the son of Korea. That is Yahya, or the name John, in the Hebrew. And so, again, we ask the question. The Quran says, allegedly to Zechariah, speaking on behalf of God, we're giving your son the name John. Nobody's ever had that name before. It's never existed. This is a new deal. And yet, we find that in the Old Testament already, hundreds of years before the events with Zechariah. They don't add up. The Quran said this. The Bible showed that it wasn't true, and, and, and we can find evidence showing the Bible was written hundreds of years before the Quran. The two don't merge. 
And therefore, even either way you look at it, the Quran does not come out looking like a book from God. All right, another event in the Quran which shows us kind of the absurdity of it. One of the things that we find is the event relating to King Solomon. King Solomon, according to the Quran, was evidently taught the language of birds and the language of ants. In his battles, uh, allegedly, Solomon used birds extensively to drop clay bricks on Abra's army and he marched them into military parades. He also used them to bring messages of powerful queens. Here's the actual reading from the Quran, chapter 27, verses 18 and 19. Until when they came upon the valley of the ants, now listen to this, and an ant said, O ants, Enter your dwellings that you not be crushed by Solomon and his soldiers while they perceive it not. So Solomon smiled, amused at her speech, and said, My Lord, enable me to be grateful for your favor which you have bestowed upon me and upon my parents, and to do righteousness of which you approve, and admit me by your mercy into the ranks of your righteous servants. Then in chapter 27, verse 16, not only did Solomon speak to ants, he also spoke to birds. And Solomon inherited David. And he said, O people, we have been taught the language of birds. We've been given from all things. Indeed, this is evident bounty. And so again, things that just are not true. Things that we just don't find to be reliable and trustworthy. Does Solomon talk to ants? Does Solomon talk to birds? Again, we find that not to be trustworthy or true either. And then we find another very interesting example which shows kind of the absurdity of some things written in the Quran. Chapter 18 and verses 9 through 25, we have a story where it tells, uh, tells of certain young people and a dog who sleep in a cave for some 309 years with their eyes open and their ears closed. 309 years sleeping in a cave with a dog with their eyes open and their ears closed. Again, those things are just not really believable and true. Here's another example of that. We find another example in the Quran, chapter 2, verses 65 through 66, and in chapter 7, verse 163 through 167. And this is such an interesting and yet odd story. In this context, uh, evidently, or allegedly, Allah turns certain fishing people who break the Jewish Sabbath into apes for their disobedience. Uh, listen to these words, chapter 2, verse 65 through 66 of the Quran. And indeed, you know those among you who transgressed in the matter of the Sabbath? We said to them, Be you monkeys, despised and rejected. And we made it a deterrent punishment for those who are present and those who succeeded them, and a lesson for those who fear Allah. What? Turn people into monkeys and apes for breaking the Sabbath? Again, where did, where did all this come from? Where did Muhammad get the idea of ants and speaking of birds and, and monkeys and things like that? You know, here's the point of mentioning all this. After looking at some of these far-fetched ideas, you have to be left wondering, where in the world did Muhammad, Muhammad come up with this? Friend, here's the actual truth. Just like Joseph Smith, Muhammad was an excellent plagiarist. Much of what he taught or said came from other apocryphal books of his day. The story is found in chapter 7, verse 171 uh, in the Quran, and it's a story of, uh, of God lifting up Mount Sinai, and he holds it over the heads of the Jews as a threat, as though he's going to squash them if re they reject the law uh, and they're not recognizable from the biblical account. And so basically God threatens the Jews, holds it over their head in the Quran, holds Mount Sinai over their head and threatens them to obey Him. And then we've got the mention of this. Chapter 7, verse 171, When we raised the mountain above them as it was a dark cloud and they were certain that it would fall upon them, God said, Take what we have given you with determination and remember what is in it that you might fear Allah. Now, where in the world did that come from? Well, here again is one of Muhammad's plagiarisms. This story of God taking Mount Sinai and holding it over the Jews' head as a threat. This story actually comes from a second century apocryphal Jewish book, the Abada Sarah. 
Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. How did this story from a second century Jewish apocryphal book end up in the Quran? Friend, Muhammad was a great plagiarizer. He had been reading some of those. There were copies of them evidently available. He had seen that, and like Joseph Smith, who copied much of the Bible and put it in the Mormon Bible, he saw things of that day that people might have believed in or might have thought were fanciful, and he worked those into the Quran. And so, three to four centuries before the Quran is written, we have this story already in a Jewish apocryphal book, and Muhammad copied it in there. I'll give you another example. In the Quran, chapter 19, verses 22 through 26, we read the story of, of Mary and baby Jesus, and they're under a palm tree, and this rivulet flows below them. This story is not found in the biblical account anywhere. We don't read of Jesus and Mary under a palm tree or some river flowing under them, but here's where it is. It first appeared in an apocryphal fable of the second century. Oh, think about this. Here's what it says in chapter 19, verses 22 through 26. So she conceived Jesus, this is Mary, and she retired with him to a remote place. And the pains of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a palm tree. She cried in her anguish, Ah, would that I died before this. Would that I had been a thing forgotten and out of sight. But a voice cried to her from beneath the palm tree, Grieve not, for your Lord has provided a rivulet beneath you and shake towards thyself the trunk of the palm tree and it will let fresh ripe dates fall upon you so eat and drink and cool thine eye. Now here's what we have recorded in the lost books of the Bible. Now on the third day after Mary was wearied in the desert by the heat she asked Joseph to rest for a little while in the shade of a palm tree. Then Mary looking up and seeing its branches laden with fruit said I desire, if it were possible, to have some fruit. Just then the child Jesus looked up from below with a cheerful smile and said to the palm tree, Send down some fruit. Immediately the tree bent itself toward her, and so they ate. Then Jesus said, O palm tree, arise, be one of my father's trees in paradise, but with your roots open the fountain rivulet beneath you and bring forth water flowing from that fountain. Here you've got this story, much of it, found in the Quran, and yet years before that, second century Jewish fable, apocryphal fable, it was already in it. Friend, here's what we want you to see. Muhammad wasn't receiving revelations from Gabriel. God wasn't talking to Muhammad. Muhammad was plagiarizing other books and fables of his day, and he's working what he thinks and what he wants into the Quran. And again, this kind of showing that it's not from God, that it is made up, it is the divine, it is the making of uh, Muhammad's mind, not the mind of God. Here's another example. Later on in the Quran, chapter 19, verses 29 through 33, we find another example where the baby Jesus can evidently talk. Uh, nowhere in the gospel do we find Jesus talking as a baby. Uh, there's an account when Jesus is 12 years old where he disputed with the people in the temple. But where did this story of Jesus talking as a baby come from? Well, it's another 2nd century Arabic apocryphal fable. Here's what we have in the Quran. The Quran says in chapter 19, verses 29 through 23, But she, Mary, pointed to the babe. They said, How can we talk to one who is a child in the cradle? He said, I am indeed a servant of Allah. He hath given me revelation and made me a prophet, and he made me blessed to it wheresoever I be, and hath enjoined on me prayer and charity as long as I live. He hath made me kind to my mother and not overbearing or miserable. So peace is on me the day I was born, the day that I die, and the day that I shall be raised up to life again. The first gospel of the infancy goes on to talk about Jesus saying certain things. And so Jesus, according to you know, this, talked when he was a baby. But where in the world do you find that at in the gospel accounts or anywhere else? Well, friend, here's what you do find. You find that in an Arabic 2nd century apocryphal fable. Okay, now what does all that mean? Moses, uh, Muhammad didn't write the Quran till hundreds of years after that. We have a very similar story 
found in these second century fables. And so these are the sources. These are the origins of the ideas that are found in the Quran. These and other things, Muhammad is working into the Quran. He's not receiving revelation from Gabriel or the angel or from God. Muhammad is making stuff up and trying to put that on people as being from God. Let me give you another example. In the Quran, chapter 3, verse 49, uh, according to the Quran, Jesus actually breathed life into birds of clay. Now the source for this, this Quranic example, is actually found in the Gospel of Thomas in the infancy of Jesus, which is a second century apocryphal fable. Here's what the Quran says, chapter 3, verse 49, And appoint him Jesus, a messenger to the children of Israel, with this message, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, and that I make for you out of clay, as it were, the figure of a bird, and breathe into it, and it becomes a bird by Allah's leave." Now Thomas' Gospel of the infancy of Jesus, second century, apocryphal fable, which has been denied as being from God and true, has been proven as being from God and not true. Here's what it says. Then he took from the bank of the stream some soft clay, and formed out of it twelve sparrows, then Jesus, clapping together the palms of his hands, called to the sparrows and said to them, Go fly away. Where in the world did Muhammad get this idea of Jesus turning birds, uh, in, uh, making birds out of clay? Well, friend, I think you can see. He was plagiarizing. He was reading other books of his day. He was looking from fables and things like that. And we can know that's not from God, that those things are not true, and we can know what is right and true from God. And so when we think about things like having Samaritans hundreds of years before they existed, when we think about you know, the adoption of Moses and the errors there and all the plagiarism that goes along with it, friend, it helps us to see the Quran is not a book from God. The Quran is a hoax that was put on the world by Muhammad and the evidence can prove it's not true. Now let me take just to show a few minutes to show you that the, the, the teachings of Islam and the Quran, they contradict some of the teachings that we're going to find in the Bible about Christ, about other things, and about salvation. For example, in the Quran we are taught that Jesus Himself he was not from God. He is not the teacher of God. Let me give you just a few examples as it relates to creation. We're taught in the Quran about creation, these things. The Quran says in chapter 41, verse 9, and chapter 10, verse 12, that creation took eight days. It says in chapter 10, verse 3, that creation took six days. The universe was produced by some big bang. In the Quran, according to chapter 21, verse 30, by some type of gaseous explosion. And then we find it stating that God created every living thing from water. Now, why mention all of that in the Quran? You've got eight days, you've got six days, you've got coming from some explosion, you've got it being all created from water. Well, friend, there's a multitude of creation ideas in the Quran, but the Bible is consistent over and over again. God created the world in six days. Genesis 1-1, Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. God spoke the world into existence. Genesis 1, Psalm 148, verse 5. And we also see that Christ was an active agent in creation. Now, let me show you some errors in the Quran uh, as it relates to women, how they contradict what the Bible teaches about women. The Quran says in the Quran, chapter 2, verse 28, 228, that men have authority over women. In the Quran, chapter 4, Verse number 34, it says this, Men have authority over women because Allah has made the one superior to the other and because they spend their wealth to maintain them. Now again, we don't find teachings like that in the Bible. Although God has a, a, a hierarchy, God has placed man as the head of the home, it's not because we're superior in that sense or because we spend all our money to maintain them. That's because the way God set it up and the way God wants it to be according to His hierarchy and things of that nature. Now, let me give you a few other teachings as it relates to women and things related to that which you can see clearly contradict the Bible. Here's what they say concerning women. Women who disobey, the Quran says, should actually be beaten. Chapter 4, verse 34, Good women are obedient. As for those from whom you fear disobedience, admonish them and send them to beds apart and beat them. Then if they obey you, take no further action against them. That's the Quran chapter 4, verse number 34. Well, friend, is that what the Bible teaches husbands to do? No. 
Husbands are to love their wives, to respect them to give them due respect as they deserve and, and things related unto that that are true and right and good. And so, as we've thought today about the Quran, friend, we've shown much evidence how it contradicts the teaching of the Bible, how it contradicts itself, how there are things in it that j j just don't make good sense, that don't add up with what's right and true. And friend, we want someone to see that evidence so they can know this is not from God. Islam is not God's religion. Muhammad was not a prophet of God. The Bible and Jesus Christ are the right way. You see, Jesus came into the world to save man from his sins. Matthew 1, verses 19 through 21, the Scripture says, You'll call his name Jesus. He'll save his people from their sins. Christ went about doing good. The Bible has been confirmed over and over again. The evidence overwhelmingly shows that the Bible is the Word of God and that man can trust it. And Jesus, the Scripture said, has done all things well. Friend, we hope today as you think about these things that you'll realize the Bible and Christ's message, that's the real truth. And that salvation is found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask you today, have you obeyed the Gospel? Are you a Christian? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? You may be saying, well, what do I need to do to become a follower of Christ? Have you heard the message of Jesus Christ? The Bible says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. Having heard that message, looked at the evidence, searched it, proved it to be true, do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. John chapter 8, verse number 24. Would you repent of sin? and turn to God. Luke chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Would you confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men? The Bible says, With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, verse 10. And Jesus Himself said, You must be baptized to be saved. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel, we're urging you today, look at the evidence, look at the information, obey the gospel, and become a Christian while you have time and opportunity. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.